الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله This is now episode 61 of the podcast The Forward with myself brother Mahdi Locke and today's topic is Imam Ghazali on protecting the stomach which is uh, a section from his book Minhaj al-Abidin Legend of Rabbil Alameen published by Dal Minhaj in Jeddah and I published this section because it's a small chapter from his book uh, on my blog a few years ago and it's also the first appendix of the book uh, The Restoration of Wealth which is a translation of Islah al-Mal by Imam Ibn Abi dunya uh, it was a translation done by myself and Adi Setia published in 2016 so I'm going to read from the book but also you can access it from my blog I'll put a link below uh, inshallah so without much further ado let's get into the topic the stomach and its protection. The Imam says, Then you must, and may Allah grant you success, protect your stomach and rectify it. It is indeed the most difficult of organs for the one who strives, i.e. the mushtahid, to rectify. I, the one who strives to better himself and to become a better believer and draw closer to Allah, he will find the greatest difficulty in rectifying his stomach. The Imam continues. He says, It is the most troublesome and the most distracting. It is the most harmful and has the most widespread effect. This is because it is the fountainhead and source. From it, all the states of the other limbs come to be, strength and weakness, abstinence and willfulness, and so forth. So in other words, what the Imam is saying is, what you eat, what you consume, is going to affect how your body feels, and what your body does, in fact as well as we're we're going to see. It's very, very important. Controlling the stomach is very, very important. So he says, uh, the imam, he continues, he says, therefore you must firstly safeguard it against the unlawful and the doubtful, and secondly against going to excess with regards to the lawful, if your intention and desire is to worship Allah the Exalted. Very, very good point. If your intention is 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 to worship Allah the Exalted, that's your desire and your intention, then you have to be careful of going to the, going to excess with the lawful. As for the unlawful and the doubtful, you are obliged to look in the, into them because of three matters. And this it should be quite obvious that the, the unlawful should be avoided because it's unlawful. The doubtful should be avoided because you don't know what the ruling is. It's not clear. Um, and this is discussed in the Imam's book, uh, the book of the lawful and the unlawful, Kitab al al Haram, uh, which I translated into Alhamdulillah about eight years ago. It's uh, also published in, in Malaysia. It's available in some bookshop, uh, bookshops, some online bookstores uh, in the Anglosphere, like Kitabun, I believe. Um, and there are some links on my blog as well, where the Imam goes, the Imam goes into great detail about uh, the halal and, the, and then the haram, and then doubtful matters, especially, about having carefulness in, in doubtful matters. Um, very, very useful book, mashallah, very, very useful book. So, these three reasons as to why you should be careful with the, the unlawful and the doubtful. The first is be wary of the fire of hell, because Allah, glorified and exalted, has said, and this is Surah Tisa, Ayah 10, those who consume the property of orphans wrongfully consume nothing in their bellies except for fire. They will roast in a searing blaze. And the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, the fire is more deserving of every piece of flesh that grows out of ill-gotten property. It's narrated by Al-Hakim and Ibn Hibban on the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah. May Allah be pleased with both of them. And it's also related by uh, Imam Al-Tirmidhi. The second reason is that the consumer of the unlawful and the doubtful is repelled and not granted the success, the enabling success of the tawfiq to perform worship. And thus only those who are pure and purified are fit to serve Allah the Exalted. And then the Imam gives this analogy. He says, I have said, has not Allah prohibited those in a state of junub, i.e. major impurity, major ritual impurity, i.e. when someone needs a ghusl? This person is not allowed to enter the masjid. When you're in a state of junub, you're not allowed to enter the masjid. And then the other example the imam gives is someone who needs wudu. So someone who needs wudu, they're, they're in a state of hadith, they are not allowed to touch the mushaf. They're not allowed to touch the Qur'an. And obviously the evidence is here in Surah Nisa, ayah 43, Allah says, nor in a state of major impurity, unless you're traveling, until you've watched yourselves completely. So this is the proof for not entering the masjid unless you have ghusl. And then not touching the mushaf without wudu. This is Surah Al-Waqiyah, 56 chapter, verse 79. No one may touch it except the purified. 
So this is despite the this is despite the fact that to be in either state of impurity is permissible. So what about someone who is immersed in the squalor of the unlawful and the filth of ill-gotten property and doubtful matters? When will he be summoned to the service of Allah the Almighty and his noble remembrance glorified as he? That will absolutely never happen. So in other words, when you're in a state of junab or a state of hadith, these are permissible states, but you are still removed from Allah's worship to one extent or another. You mean you can't enter the masjid or you can't touch the mushaf. Uh, again, when you're, you're not vodou, you can't pray. That's another thing you could mention. But these are permissible states. So he says, what about someone who actually is actively and undoubtedly involved in the haram and they have haram income and they're consuming the, the, the uh, haram foods? How will this person draw near to Allah and worship Allah? And the imam says this will not happen. Absolutely never, it will absolutely never happen. Yahya ibn Mu'ad al-Razi, may Allah have mercy on him, said, Obedience is stored in Allah's storehouses. Their key is supplication, and the key, and the teeth of that key is the, is the lawful. If the key does not have any teeth, the door won't be opened, and if the door of the, the storehouse can't be opened, how will one arrive at the obedience that lies therein? So if you do not have, so he said, the teeth of that key is the lawful. If you don't have the lawful, if you don't be nourished by the lawful, how will you arrive at obedience and worship of Allah the Exalted? How? The third reason that the Imam mentions is that the one who consumes the unlawful and the doubtful is cut off from doing good. He's cut off from doing good, even if he's destined to do good, for it is rejected from him and not accepted from him. So someone might outwardly be doing good deeds, they might be praying and fasting and so forth, but because they're being nourished by the, by the, by the haram, it's not being accepted by Allah. Allah is not accepting it. And therefore, their worship is just fruitless. It's empty. Uh, so the Imam says, Therefore, he obtains nothing from it except toil and hardship and the taking up of his time. Right? It's just hardship, it's toil, it's labor, it's fatigue, and it's a waste of time. He, may Allah bless and grant him peace, said, How many people stand in the night to pray and all they obtain from it is sleeplessness? How many people fast and all they obtain from it our hunger and thirst. And uh, this is narrated by Ibn Khuzayma, Ibn Hibban, Al Hakim, uh, and Al Nasa'i on the authority of Abu Huraira. May Allah be pleased with him. The Imam continues It is on the authority of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with, it, with both of them, that he said, Allah does not accept the prayer of a person who has something unlawful inside of him. This is what this is. This is what he's getting at. This is the same Ibn Abbas. To sum it up, Allah does not accept the prayer of a person who has something unlawful inside of him. And you could mention at this point the difference between, say, the siha of a prayer and then the the qubul, the, the acceptance of the prayer. Right? So someone's prayer might might hourly be valid in the sense that this person has wudu, this person has ghusl, this person has covered their nakedness, this person is facing the Kaaba or facing the Qibla and so on and so forth and the prayers within the time. All these conditions are met. That's siha. That's the validity of the prayer, the outward validity of the prayer. But the qubul is whether Allah actually accepts it, and that's no, that's known to Allah alone. And what the Imam what the Imam is saying, you're quoting Ibn Abbas, that if this person has haram inside of them, that prayer will not be accepted, even though it could be outwardly valid. Allah will not accept it, and Allah knows best. Then the Imam says, as for going to excess with the lawful. Indeed, it is the plague of the ordinary worshippers and the calamity of the people of Ishtihad. I people are striving to be better, and this includes scholars as well. People are striving to be better, going to excess in the in with the lawful, with the halal. This is a calamity. And he says, I have reflected on the matter, and I have found ten evils that are the foundations of this matter. So the Imam, what you see here is that the Imam he's dealing with the unlawful and the doubtful really, really quickly. Because the unlawful is the unlawful. It's very obvious that you should avoid this. The doubtful is also quite clear to an extent. The fact that you should avoid it is clear. But what he's getting at here is the excess in the lawful. Because people don't tend to think about this. They think, well, it's halal. So what's the big deal? But no, you can go to excess with the unlawful. And it's it's a very, very dangerous thing. That's why he says it's a it's a plague for the ordinary worshiper and a calamity for the people, the people that she had. And he said there are 10 evils that I have identified upon reflection and consideration of the matter. Number one, plenteous eating 
makes the heart hard and removes its light. It has related from it has been related from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he said, Do not kill the heart with plenteous eating and drinking, for indeed the heart dies the same way crops do if too much water is poured on them. Some of the righteous, that's the end of the hadith, then he says, Some of the righteous have likened the stomach to a boiling cooking pot sitting under the heart. With steam rising up towards it, an abundance of steam will distress it and blacken it. So that is quite powerful. Do not kill the heart with plenteous eating and drinking. In the same way that you would not pour too much water on a plant because you would drown it and kill it. Number two. Plenteous eating is a tribulation for the other limbs and organs, and it provokes them and stirs them towards excess and corruption. Indeed, when a man is wantonly satiated, right, he's excessively satisfied, he's eaten too much, his eye desires to look at that which does not concern him, either something unlawful or to look at something excessively. The ear desires to listen to it, the tongue desires to articulate it, the private parts have desires for it, and the foot walks towards it. If he's hungry, all the limbs and organs are calm and still. They do not crave anything, nor are they enthusiastic about it. Al-Ustad Abu Jafar, may Allah have mercy on him, said, Indeed, the stomach is an organ. If it is hungry, then all the other organs and limbs are satiated, i.e. they are still and do not demand anything of you. And if it is satiated, i.e. if the stomach is satiated, then all the other organs and limbs are hungry. In summary, a man's actions and statements are according to his food and drink. If the unlawful goes in, then the unlawful comes out. And if excess goes in, then excess comes out. As if food is the seed of actions. And actions are the plant that manifests out of it. I mean, that's uh, just that paragraph just leaves me speechless. You have to control what you're eating. So a man's actions and statements are according to his food and drink. If the unlawful goes in, the unlawful comes out. If excess goes in, then excess comes out. It's quite, uh, quite something to think about. Number three. Plenteous eating decreases one's intelligence or decreases one's understanding and knowledge for indeed gluttony removes intelligence. Abitna pothibla fitna in the Arabic text. Ad-Darani, may Allah be pleased with him, may Allah, sorry, may Allah have mercy on him, spoke the truth when he said, Whenever you want something from this world or the hereafter, do not eat until you finished it. For indeed, eating changes the intellect. And you can see this nowadays. People aren't even Muslim doing research into, say, intermittent fasting, uh, prolonged fasting, um, even going out food and drink for 24 hours and so on and so forth. And these people will repeatedly say, my thoughts clear up. My thinking is so much clearer now. I don't, feel, I don't have, I don't have uh, brain fog or mental fog or whatever it is. This is something that constantly comes up. That when you're when you're not eating, we leave off eating. Your thinking is a lot clearer, and this is what the imam is appears to be referring to in this uh, point number three. Number four, plenteous eating decreases one's worship. Plenteous eating decreases one's worship because when a person eats a lot, his body becomes heavy. He struggles to keep his eyes open, and his limbs become languid, meaning they they lack energy, they lack vitality, they're weak. He does nothing, even if he diligently strives, but sleep like a discarded corpse. This is what happens when someone eats. And this is why some people, they prefer to eat before they go to sleep because it makes them sleep better. But that's what eating does. It makes you weak. It makes you languid. It makes you feel lazy, lackadaisical. And then you just sleep. And look at the word he uses, like a discarded corpse. That's the kind of sleep you're in. You're motionless. The imam continues, he says, It has been said, if you are paunchy, meaning you have a bit of a belly, consider yourself chronically ill. And again, you can do a little bit of research into this, right? Having a, having a belly can be a sign of uh, impending or uh, upcoming illness, right? It could be diabetes, could be other situations because there's this uh, excess fat gathered around your belly. And it has been mentioned regarding Yahya, alayhi salam, that Iblis appeared before him and he had meat and grapes and the like hanging off him. So Yahya said to him, what is this? He replied, these are the desires with which I trap the children of Adam. He said, do you find anything for me in there? He replied, no, except that you satiated yourself that one night and thus we made it too difficult for you to pray. Yahya then said, I will certainly never satiate myself after that. 
Iblis replied, I will certainly never advise anyone after that. So Imam Ghazali, he says, this is regarding someone who satiated himself one night in his life. One night in life, he, he ate to his fill, he ate his fill, and then he went to bed. So how about someone who never feels hungry for a single night in his life and then desires to engage in worship? Sufyan, may Allah have mercy on him, said, worship is an occupation. It's shops and seclusion, and its tools are hunger. And I think something, uh, a point to make here is, again, we live in a world, especially in first world countries, but it's it exists in other parts of the world now, it exists in Gulf countries and so on and so forth, where food is readily available. And not even the healthiest food. I'm talking about fast food, donuts, uh, soft drinks. These things are readily available. You can get them within minutes. They're everywhere. And... Uh, we also, a lot of us, especially people coming from the Anglosphere in Europe, we're, we're raised this idea of you know three meals a day. You need to have your three meals a day. So we get this idea in our head that we should never, ever, ever feel hungry. We should always, always feel satiated. That's how we're sort of programmed to think. That as soon as you feel the slightest hunger pangs, that's it, go. Get some food. Go to the kitchen. Get on the phone. Go to your nearest shop. Get a snack. Get something inside you. That's what we're made to think. You should never, ever, ever feel hungry. You should always feel satiated. But look what the Imam is saying here. Look what he's quoting. Talking about Yahya alayhi salam. This is someone regarding this is regarding someone who satiated himself one night in his life. So how about someone who never feels hungry for a single night? We have people nowadays who never feel hungry for a single moment. <laughs> they, they never feel hungry for a second. If they feel hungry. They feel hungry for a second or a minute. That's it. They they go, they go off and they they eat something. They get something. They put something inside because they do not want to feel hungry. And that's how a lot of us are, unfortunately, we're made to think that way. The Imam continues. He says, Through plenteous eating, one loses the sweetness of worship. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I have not satiated myself since I became Muslim. I find the sweetness of worshiping my Lord. And I have not quenched my thirst since I became Muslim, desiring to meet my Lord. These are the attributes of those who have had the veil lifted. And Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was someone who had the veil lifted and the Prophet ﷺ indicated this when he said, Abu Bakr is not superior to you by virtue of a fast or a prayer. Rather, it is something that is established in his heart. And this is narrated by Al-Hakim al tirmidhi in the Nawadr al-Usul. Um, so it's not the uh, Abu Isa tirmidhi that we're familiar with, that most of us are more familiar with. But this is a key, key point. It says, Abu Bakr is not superior to you by virtue of a fast or a prayer. It is something that is established in his heart, something inside of him. He controls his desires. He controls his appetites. Adarimi said, Worship is sweetest when my stomach is clinging to my back. Number six. There is the danger of falling into the doubtful and the unlawful because the lawful does not come to you except as nourishment and we have related that the Prophet ﷺ said, the lawful does not come to you except as nourishment, while the unlawful comes to you randomly and haphazardly. So just to summarize that quickly, if you go to excess in the lawful, it can lead to the doubtful and the unlawful. A quick summary. Number seven, the heart and the body are preoccupied by it. First, there is its acquisition. Right? You have to go out and you have to buy the food somewhere where you have to grow the food. Secondly, it's preparation. You have to cook it. Thirdly, it's consumption. Fourthly, one has to evacuate it and rid, rid oneself of it. Obviously, one has to go relieve oneself afterwards. Fifthly, one has to become safe from it because some harm from it may appear on the body or rather harm, harms and illnesses. Right, So there might be some... The, the, the food that you're eating might be infected with something. It might be toxic. It might do something to you, and therefore you become ill, and then you have to, and you have to get rid of that problem as well. He, may Allah bless grant and peace, said, the foundation of every disease is al-barada, i.e. al tukma and the foundation of every remedy is al-azma, i.e. hunger and diet. And tukma, as according to the Hansberg Dictionary, is indigestion or dyspepsia, i.e. illness from overeating. So it is on the authority of Malik bin, Din Malik bin Dinar that he would say, You people, I have relieved myself so frequently that I feel shy before my Lord and my two angels. If only Allah could put my sustenance, sustenance in some pebbles that I could suck on till I die. In summary, the seeking of this worldly life, the hoping for people, and the wasting of time because of plenteous eating is not something hidden. So we're talking here about 
food can take up a huge amount of time and energy in your day, right? You have to acquire it somehow. Then you have to prepare it. Then you have to eat it. Then you have to relieve yourself of it. And then you have to make sure that you don't, you haven't got, if you've gotten sick because of it, then you have to treat that problem. And this is something that is just huge uh, in Ramadan, right? Because here we are on the cusp of Ramadan. This is a very, very important thing. Ramadan, which is the month of fasting, it's the month of fasting and it's the month of Quran, is for Muslims by and large, that's a very, very sad thing to say, is the month of eating, is the month of food. One of my fifth teachers told me a long time ago, more food is consumed and purchased in this month than the other 11 months combined. It's food month. When it should be the opposite, and we have people, and I, and I really I sympathize with women folk, especially that have to spend hours and hours and hours during the fasting day when they could be reading Quran and just resting, and and uh, giving themselves their energy for for tarawih and night worship and so forth. They're in the kitchen preparing food like three hours before iftar, four hours four hours before iftar, sometimes eight hours before iftar or more, spending the whole day. Thinking about iftar, iftar like iftar is this major, huge event every day that requires hours upon hours and hours of work and dedication, and that's not what it should be. Iftar should just be something very, very simple. It just should be something very, very simple. You know, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but I mean, I I generally prefer uh, in Ramadan. I, I I like having iftar with with Muslim brothers who are like not with their wives or they're single, whatever, I find that much easier and straightforward because iftar is not something that's actually thought about until maybe 20 minutes before. 20 minutes before sunset, maybe half an hour before sunset, we start thinking about iftar. Okay, sun's going to go, go, go down, so what should we do? Let's get together some salad. Let's get some hummus going. Let's get some scrambled eggs going. Something simple, and that's it. Very, very simple, but, you know, but a lot of people, and again, it's part of the culture as well to do this, is that iftar has to be a big thing. A lot of effort has to be put into it. A lot of hours have to be spent preparing it. And it can be three, four, five hours. And it, it's, it's excessive. And this is, this is the problem. This is like with, with all this eating. Is that we're dedicating so much time and effort just for food. It's like, we're, it's like we're the slaves of food. Food isn't serving us. We're serving food. We're living for food. It's, uh, it's horrible. It's a horrible plague. Number eight. Oh, we're just you know, like just reading that again. Number seven. Summary: The seeking of this worldly life, the hoping for people, the wasting of time, the wasting of time because of plenteous eating is not something hidden. Anyway, number eight. What one obtains from the affairs of the hereafter, and the severity of the pangs of death. Right. This is the, the, the eighth problem with excessive eating. What one obtains from the affairs of the hereafter and the severity of the pangs of death is re- has been related in the reports, i.e. the al-akhbar in Arabic, that the severity of the pangs of death is according to the pleasures of one's life. So whoever had more of the latter will get more of the former. Right? If you if you, if you have more of the pleasures of your of, of life, then you get more of the severity of the pangs of death. And Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Number nine. Less reward in the end. Allah the Exalted has said, you dissipated the good things you had in your worldly life and the rest of the ayah. So this is Surah Al-Ahqaf, the 46th chapter, verse 20. And the rest of the ayah is, and you enjoyed yourself in it. So today you are being repaid with the punishment of humiliation for being arrogant in the earth without any right and for being deviators. So Imam Ghazali explains, he says, thus, to the extent that you take from the pleasures of this life, your pleasures in the hereafter will be decreased. And we can see this meaning when Allah the Exalted displayed this worldly life to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said to him, And I will not decrease anything from your and I will not decrease anything from your hereafter. Uh, he made this exclusively for him, which means that for those besides him there will be a decrease, right? So he's doing mafhum mukhalifa here. This is a basic uh usuli principle where you uh you ex- you, you extract the opposite understanding. Right, so mafum mukhalifa. Just quickly go off topic here, but for example, if Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Hujurat, Allah says, uh, Right, if a fast comes to you with uh, some information, tells you some news, right, a fast, an untrustworthy person, they bring you some news. Uh, 
clarify it, check it. Don't just accept it, right? That's, 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 that's the clear command in that verse. If a corrupt person comes to you, an untrustworthy person comes to you with some news, check it. The Mufhum Mukhalifa, therefore, is, well, if a trustworthy person comes to you, if a trustworthy person comes to you with some news, then you don't have to check it because that person is trustworthy. So what Imam Ghazali is doing here is saying is that he, that because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, was given, uh, he was offered everything, um, and Allah said, I will not decrease anything from your her- hereafter. Right? He, was, he was displayed, he was offered everything of this worldly life, and Allah said, I will not decrease anything from your hereafter. What this means is that for everyone else, there will be a decrease. There won't be, there won't be, a, de- there won't be a decrease for the Messenger of Allah, so I them, but there will be a decrease for us. If we increase in our pleasures of this world, there will be a decrease in our pleasures of the hereafter. Except for those, as Imam Ghazali says, except for those whom Allah has bestowed his favor upon. The Imam continues, it has been narrated that Khalid ibn al-Walid hosted Omar, hosted Omar ibn al-Khattab and prepared some food for him. Omar said, this is for us. So what about the poor emigrants who died and did not satiate themselves with barley bread? Khalid replied, they have paradise, O commander of the believers. Omar then said, if they have obtained paradise, and this is our portion of this worldly life, then they have clearly set themselves apart from us, meaning they're on a higher standard, a higher rank. It has also been clearly narrated that Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, felt thirsty one day, so he asked for some water. A man thus gave him a vessel of water in which some dates had been thrown in. When Omar had brought it close to his mouth, he found the water to be cold and sweet, so he refrained, and he, and he said, Ah. The man then said, By Allah, I did not diminish its sweetness, O commander of the believers. Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, replied, This is what prevented me from drinking it. Woe to you! If it were not for the hereafter, I would share with you in your way of living. So again, we can see Omar is he's thinking about the hereafter and therefore he's refraining from the pleasures and delights of this world. Even if they're so small, like this, the sweetened water, for example. Number 10. Number 10 is the final one. Confinement and reckoning and the blame and censure that occurs when one leaves off etiquette by engaging in excess and following one's desires. The lawful of this worldly life is a reckoning and it's unlawful is a punishment and its embellishment leads to destruction. And this is the thing about excessive eating. Like excessive eating uh, leads to obesity, leads to various health problems and it can lead to blame and censor where people think that this, that people can look at, at, at someone who engages in, in excessive eating and think this person doesn't really have uh Someone might think this person doesn't really have control over themselves, someone who is obese or, or engaged in excessive eating, and therefore they can receive uh, censure and blame uh, from people around them. Now, the Imam finishes off here and he says, These are the ten, and just one of them would suffice for the one who looks at him. So, mushtahid. You must be extremely cautious when it comes to nourishment so that you do not fall into something unlawful or doubtful, thus making your punishment necessary. Then you must restrict yourself with regards to the lawful, to that which enables you to worship Allah the Exalted. And then you won't fall into some evil that will have you remain in confinement and reckoning, and with Allah the Glorified is every success. Alhamdulillah. So, I think that is clear. You can read the text online on my, on my blog. But I think it's a key to, way to summarize this is that you have to understand that your body is an instrument of worship. That's, that's why you've been given it. It's an amana from Allah. It's a trust from Allah. It's an instrument of worship. That's why you've been giving it. Yet that's why you've been given this body. And therefore, you have to take care of it. You have to take care of it. I mean, we, we have a situation now, and I see this a lot where I live, where people are not, they're not old. I've seen Muslim brothers who are not old. But because they eat so much, because they eat so much, they can't actually pray properly. They have to pray on a chair. They can't go into sujood. They can't do ruku' properly because they're so big. Think about that. Think about that. Right? They're not. They're not praying on a chair because they're old, right? Which is natural. They're not praying on a chair because they're they're injured or because they're they have some debilitating illness or something. No, they're praying on a chair. They can't actually do sujood in these in these other parts of the prayer because. They're overfed. 
for that reason and that reason alone, they're too big, they're overfed, they're obese. That is a sad, sad state to be in. That's a sad state to be in. You can't go into Sujood because you're obese. So these are things, some things to think about. And as we head into Ramadan, inshallah, we hope that Ramadan will be a month of restricted eating, uh, not going to excess at iftar and at suhoor, and that we learn to control ourselves, control our desires, and to be careful. Obviously, the, the, the haram is the haram, but we need to be careful with the halal. That's what we need to do. We need to be careful with the halal. And with Allah alone is our success. Inshallah, I will come again uh, to do another podcast within the next couple of weeks uh, to find more Ramadan topics to do and come out with more translations, inshallah, because that is also important this time. And um, I think that's it. I think I'll finish there. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.